thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Digitally Diverse, where we take a deep dive into the career journeys of the movers and the shakers of the Australian design and tech industry. So today we are lucky to have Lisa Jacquio here with us, the product design manager of AOLX. Thank you so much for joining us. No worries. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I would love to have a bit of an overview of your journey so far, Lisa. Where have you come from? What's been, you know, the twists and turns of your career to date? Cool. Um, So I'll keep it short. I hail from France originally, uh, but left to the US when I was 18 to study finance at the University of San Francisco. And then one thing led to another. I ended up staying in the US to work and found a job at Glassdoor as a French product specialist. And so what that involved was just launching Glassdoor in different French speaking markets. So Switzerland, Belgium, France, of course, French Canada, et cetera. So these were my first steps in in the product world. And then as part of that, started working with UX designers, thought what they were doing was way cooler than than what I was doing (laughs) and ended up going back to school for design part-time at uh, UC Berkeley Extension and then transitioned into design at Glassdoor and then continued on to design with Miyagi, a small retail software startup, and then continued on at Airwallix, where I am today. Awesome. And so did you start at Glassdoor at kind of like when it was just starting to get off the ground or how long ago was that? Yeah, so that was in 2014. Uh, If I remember correctly, we were maybe, I was employee number 360, something like that. Mm -hmm. So the company is way bigger now, I think. Well, they've been acquired by Indeed, so it's a huge, huge thing now. But yeah, France was the first country where Glassdoor expanded, non-English country where Glassdoor expanded. So yeah, it was the very first steps of international expansion, which was um, pretty exciting times. Yeah, really cool. And um, now you're at Airwallex. You you started there when you were still in the States, right? No, actually, so I missed that part of the story. <laughs> so uh, while working at Miyagi, um, so, so Miyagi is Australian-based, but they had an office in San Francisco. Uh, but most of my team was based in Melbourne. And so I moved over in January 2020, right before COVID, uh, to be closer to the team and then stayed with them until uh, November November 2020, where I joined Airwallex. So I started with Airwallex fully, fully remotely during COVID. A story that a lot of people have, right? It, and it, I guess, was it, do you consider it good timing that you came just before the lockdowns or bad timing? <laughs> well, it depends how you see it. I mean, obviously, I don't think I ever got to know Melbourne um, and, and its full potential. I just have a very biased view of Mel- Melbourne and didn't really have a great time. So that was probably bad timing. But then you know, that led me to try and escape lockdown and move to Cairns, where I am today. And I don't think I would be where I am today. And I wouldn't have discovered, you know, things like scuba diving on the Great Barrier Reef had I not moved. So I'm actually very happy with where I'm at today. And I don't think that would have happened without COVID and lockdown, to be honest. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's kind of had a huge impact with a lot of people who are in your position as well. There's so many designers that I chat with who are living in like that Sunshine Coast area upwards. And it's really cool that they can still have that amazing work-life balance, but still be able to work on some really cutting edge stuff. I'd love to know a little bit more about what you are doing at Airwallex. Like what, what kind of role um, do you have as the manager of product design and what kind of problems are you guys tackling at the moment? So just a bit of background on Airwallex, we're cross-border payment platform, trying to help businesses, you know, scale globally. And then on top of cross-border payments, we do, uh, we're trying to become the one-stop shop for a finance team when it comes to managing their spend. And so that's what my team focuses on, the whole spend management side of things. You know, we look after products like uh, the Airwallex corporate cards, the expense management solution that sort of comes with that. Uh, we're working on a new bill pay product. Then we've got a few other top secret uh, projects that we're working on. But yeah, just really exciting stuff. We're really trying to service um, SMEs from you know 200 plus employees all the way to bigger corporations. And so, yeah, there's a few different challenges that comes with trying to service companies of different sizes. What kind of draw drawed you to joining Airwallex? Was there a particular uh, project that they were working on or w- what kind of was the catalyst for that? It, it was COVID. I was 
probably looking for a change, uh, something a bit exciting in my life that wasn't just baking. <laughs> to... Like we all tried to make bread and <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I was just looking for something exciting, to, looking for a change. And uh, Airwallex, you know, is an Australian unicorn, and so I thought, okay, probably a good place to be. I know they're moving really fast and just growing really fast. So I thought, you know, in terms of career progression, that probably would be a good place um, to go to. And they had just launched their corporate cards product. So the whole business accounts team actually didn't exist at the time. And shortly after I joined, I started working on this expense management solution from, you know, ground up. So yeah, I, I just knew that there would be a ton of exciting projects um, when I joined. And that, that was sort of what pushed me to join. Yeah, no, I, I can understand that, you know, it, especially at that point when there was so much growth and so much um, investment going on in startups, they obviously have had such an exciting roadmap ahead. It makes sense that you'd want to like to see what all the, see what all the fuss is about almost and yeah. uh, get involved. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to be a part of something exciting, really. Yeah, cool. Now, Lisa, I'm sure that you can't really disclose too much uh, about the next 12 months for Airwallex, but can you fill us in on, you know, some of the some of the things that you and the team have got going on at the moment? Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so like I said, we're really trying to be the one stop shop uh, for businesses when it comes to their financial solutions, and so we've got a couple of products on the roadmap um, that we're building from zero to one, which is really exciting. But as part of that comes challenges like at the moment information architecture challenges, like where, where does that all fit um, within the IA? How, how do we position these new products uh, in relation to the products we already have? And so driving alignment can be really challenging as a team, making sure that we're all, we all have a common vision in terms of where we're going and, and what we want to build is, is a challenge that we have at the moment. So um, we've got lots of customer calls, scheduled a lot of review sessions with stakeholders, these sorts of things to uh, really make sure that we're all happy with, with where we're going. And then from a cultural perspective as well, you know, we, we're growing as a team and we've got people based in Australia, people based in Singapore, people based in San Francisco. So as we're working on these complex projects, it's like, you know, how, how do we make sure that everyone feels included and everybody has a voice and we're collaborating in a way that yeah is, is inclusive of everybody yeah yeah how does how does that um kind of show up obviously I know that differences in time zones is probably the the thing that comes up day to day but is there um any other initiatives that you guys have to make sure that everyone's like collaborating and feeling included yeah well on a day-to-day -day basis obviously we try and schedule meetings at times that work for everybody and if someone can't make it obviously you know documentation is really important so making sure that we've got notes um we also have shared forums where we share work async um so that's one way that we do it but otherwise we've got some some rituals um weekly just to make sure that um, we have these checkpoints regularly during the week where everybody can come together sort of meet face to face and and have a have that voice or have a forum for that voice. So we'll have, you know, you know, Friday design review, like just typical design rituals. And then another thing that we've been doing is launching a design guild. So that's a, a forum that's it's not necessarily related to work. So we don't come in there talking about current projects that we're working on, but it's more about, you know, sharing about design, trying to get people excited about what's going on in the industry, uh, bringing in people from outside Airwallex to chat, so guest speakers, uh, to share about what they're doing, bring people together that way and, and build that culture that way and that unique sort of Airwallex design voice. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I, I think it's always really uh, smart to bring in some outside or external perspectives, right? Because that is only going to make the product and the work that you guys are doing internally a little bit more polished and it's great to you know have that all that stuff going on internally but you know sometimes it does become a bit of a bubble so bringing in like some fresh fresh ideas is always good too yeah for sure it, especially you know as I've, I've been at the company for almost three years now we've got a lot of old timers as well like you just get you, you we tend to get stuck in our ways of doing things and things that just we think work within Airwallex 
but I always find it helpful to hear from other people and yeah, get some ideas for, for things we might be doing better. I'd be curious to hear what your education path and how, how, how it translates now into, you know, you did a Bachelor of Finance. Obviously, you're now working in a fintech, but not necessarily on the finance side of things. So can you walk us through how your university journey has led you to where you're at now? Yeah, it, it was a very go with the flow sort of journey. Like I didn't have any plans when I started uni. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I actually started doing business school in France. And that was sort of very generalist program. And two years later, I was like, okay, you know, I'm still in my home country, in my hometown. I just want to go see something else. Um, and so the U.S. just happened to have uh, transfer programs. So they transfer your credits over and you don't have to start your bachelor's from the very beginning. And I just specialized in finance because I thought that was within business, that's what would open the most doors, having that sort of analy analytical background. At the time, I thought, well, you know, HR, marketing, all this is a bit of, it's a bit of fluff. <laughs> you know, it, it was my opinion at the yeah, time. No, I might yeah. be thinking differently today, but that's how I was thinking at the time. It's very, yeah, you can, you can put it into use in so many different scenarios. So yeah, I totally get that, you know, it's, it's a handy skill and background to have. Yeah, exactly. And then I ended up in product really by luck. So at the time after I finished studying, I really wanted to stay in the US, but I needed a visa, a work visa to stay there. And the only way I could get one was if I had skills that locals didn't have. And so the only skill I had was um, the fact that I spoke French. So that's how I ended up at Glassdoor, launching Glassdoor in, in different French markets. And that allowed me to stay in the States. So starting in product was totally you know, random and, and lucky, I would say. And I ended up loving it, but I didn't know I would. Like landed in it. <laughs> yeah, I just sort of landed in it. And then similarly, I sort of landed in UX. So as I said earlier, I started working with UX designers, thought, you know, they got to do the cool stuff. They got to talk to customers and really shape the, the product experience and got to be creative and how things looked like and, and behaved. Yeah, I talked about, you know, going into UX forever. And then a mentor of mine was like, look, Lisa, you've been talking about going into UX for maybe two years now. Maybe you should do something about this. And so that's how I um, finally decided to go back to school part time. And yeah, everything after that was just sort of, again, you know, going with the flow, taking the opportunities that showed up. And mm -hmm. yeah, I'm pretty happy with where I'm at now, to be honest. Love that. And I think you mentioned that you went to, was it, um, you did part-time at Berkeley? Yeah, correct. What kind of program was that? Yeah, so it, it's actually with UC Berkeley Extension, so slightly less prestigious than UC Berkeley. Um, <laughs> no, I, no, I don't want to take no, the credit, right, you know. <laughs> but yeah, so, so it was a, I think it's called Professional Program and User Experience. And it's geared towards full-time professionals. And so all the classes were after you know, 6 p.m. when people get off work and you can take as long as you need to complete the program. It's seven classes, 14 credits, something like that. And yeah, it took me about a year and a half. Uh, it's actually a lot of work. Just even taking two classes per semester was was a lot. Yeah, cl glad I got it done. Um, and it, it really gives you good foundations of, of UX. So I, I had considered going to, you know, doing boot camps, for example, versus this more complete program. And the feedback that I had gotten from the internal team, design team at Glassdoor was that boot camps didn't really give you that good foundation and, and the time that you needed to absorb all the knowledge and apply it. And yeah, I'm, I'm really happy I went, went that route. It was a good program. I think that's so true that comparing the boot camps between something that's a little bit more formal, you know, sometimes it gets mixed reviews with like, what's better and what what do you learn more and who, what sets you up better for success later on. And to be completely honest, I'm I'm pretty mixed myself, like with what I would recommend students to do. So yeah, it's interesting that you kind of did something that was almost in the middle, like not quite a full on bachelor's program, but um, something that's a little bit longer than, you know, your three month boot camp. So would, would that be something that you would recommend to people wanting to get into design? Sorry, doing that sort of part-time program and then moving on to design. Yeah, doing something 
that time. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely would. I think what helped me eventually land a job in the industry was uh, first having some sort of product knowledge, given my experience at Glassdoor, and then combining that with something that an education that was a bit more informal than just a UX boot camp. Mm -hmm. And then the fact that it was part time allowed me to work with the design team internally and ask them for projects on the side. So I was doing that on top of my regular workload. Nice. But yeah, it, it was just good to have, you know, school on one side, then actual real life UX projects to, to work on without being, you know, fully part of the UX team. And it was low, low impact stuff, but still gives you a sense of how you might work with engineers, with other PMs, with other designers. Like how do you integrate a design system within your work? How do you set up a Figma file or at the time sketch? <laughs> so yeah, it, it was it was just really good practical experience to have in addition to the part-time studies. Yeah, oh, that's that's great that you were you're so lucky that you were able to be like just reach out to someone internally and be like, hey, how can I help? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. Honestly, I, I don't know how I would have done it otherwise. Yeah, if I wasn't working in a company that that had a design team I think it's really hard to to get into the industry otherwise yeah it makes the it makes the um, aspect of who you know in the industry it is really important to be able to network and to be able to you know ask for help and ask for the professionals and the leaders in the industry to ask them questions about you know their career and what what you can provide value with at that stage in your career Mm -hmm. So yeah, kudos to you for like actually making it happen and putting yourself out there. Yeah, I mean, I f- I feel grateful that they allowed me to you know c- contribute because I I think about some of the designs that I made back then in 2014 and stuff that went onto the homepage to like giant buttons on a cover page. It's just very ugly stuff. I'm like I can't believe you let me you let me do that. But thanks for the experience. It was great great learning experience. Yeah, that's how that's how we learn. Yeah, we learn. yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, Lisa, you mentioned before that you were intrigued with product at Glassdoor, and that's kind of what you that's what you wanted to get into. You you knew that then. Um, but is there anything else that compelled you to start a career in design and tech? Well, not really at the start. So, as I mentioned, I was I was in San Francisco at the time. It's the Silicon Valley, and so a lot of the internships that my classmates were doing and all of the job opportunities that they took after college were in tech, just because that's what most like that's the sort of uh, opportunities that was in San Francisco at the time. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I sort of followed the same path, but then once you get into it, you realize that you really are at the forefront of technology and what's happening in the world today, which is a super exciting place to be in. And I also thought that tech in San Francisco was at the forefront of just employment practices. So, you know, being able to work in a hybrid model, work from home a couple days a week, for example, coming to work in flip-flops, like coming to work as you are sort of thing was in my mind very novel as a new thing, you know, that I really enjoyed. And when I was comparing this to some of my uh, classmates from France that went into say consulting or finance and that had to work work with suits and stuff, I just, it, it just didn't match my personality really. So I just felt like I had found a good home, if, if that makes sense just identified with the employment practices and yeah just again the exciting projects being at forefront of technology I just thought that was really exciting and so I just yeah decided to stay for that reason and also because it pays quite well I have to say I mean it doesn't hurt it does doesn't it? <laughs> yeah that really shines a light especially in like those mid 2010s 20 teens where you're, you're right like the Silicon Valley it was almost like the shining light that everyone wanted to strive towards like oh you know if you work in tech if you're like wearing a t-shirt and shorts to work and it's like it almost um glamorized being casual yeah I feel like a lot of places have tried to emulate that since and offer you know some of the perks that 
or meta now, but Facebook back then would try and like, you know, make people stay longer at work by providing like every meal under the sun that you could possibly imagine and do your laundry for you. Like it's. <laughs> I have to say, I practically lived in the office um, and I loved it. You know, we had meals provided, we had a gym, we had a kombucha tab, a beer tab, we had ping pong tables, we had video games. Yeah, it was just great. And oh, we also had dogs in the office. I think that that was a yeah. major contributor to my happiness at work. Game changer. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's just having golden retrievers running around. Yeah, it's, it's just a golden era now that I think about it. Yeah, definitely. And I guess like looking at where you are now, obviously in Cairns and working remotely and, you know, looking very beachy with your, for those who are just listening on audio, um, Lisa is just chilling with like her little seashell necklace on and <laughs> just like living the life up north. And I think those like flexible perks are still there if you are wanting them at a lot of different companies around the world now. So it's great that you've like realized that that's really where you want to stay and they are non-negotiables and to just jump at any opportunity that you can that fits around, you know, your work-life balance. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I feel like I can be pr- more productive and, and be there for my team more if mm-hmm. outside of work I'm happy and fulfilled and, and doing what really makes me happy. So it's win-win for everybody, I think. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, we briefly chatted about your education pathway and how that translated into tech and where you are now. Would you give any advice to students potentially wanting to start a career in technology? And yeah, what what would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, if people know that they want to get into tech, I think going into school for engineering or data science, even, you know, human HCI programs, I think it's human computer interaction programs for UX opens a ton of doors just great to get the foundations really early in the in your career but then there's a lot of people that don't necessarily have technical backgrounds that can still go and work in tech so for example at airwallex we have a huge commercial team that sells our solutions and you still need to be a bit tech savvy and understand you know what we're doing which can be a super interesting and fulfilling job and still in tech without necessarily having that technical background Similarly, you know, you have all the other support functions like marketing and HR, finance, et cetera. So yeah, many ways to go into tech without actually, you know, being a nerd and God, sorry, I don't know if it's just said that. <laughs> so, you know, without uh, being the typical without engineer. Like yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, yep. <laughs> no, I totally get that. And those people are just as important to any tech company as what the engineers are. Oh, absolutely. If we don't have a commercial team, there's no one to sell the product for us. So th- then we don't have the money to hire the engineers and the designers that are building the products. So mm-hmm. yeah, it, everybody's important. And I'd be curious to hear what kind of lights you up and motivates you to do what you do day to day. Yeah, so really having the customer in mind and keeping the customer in mind is what motivates me. So it always makes me happy when, um, you know, I talk to a customer and they've been using something that I've designed, say our expense management solution at Airwallex and hearing that it's been going well and it's um, simplified their work life a little bit and relieved some of their pain points. It's always cool when you see that you have real impact. Yeah. On, on someone. Um, Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really it. And then the team, you know, we have a great team at Airwallex. We get along really well. And so they motivate me to put out my best work. I feel like that's a really important part for me of, of work is having people I yeah, collaborate well with. Yeah, that collaboration piece and that connection with the team is so, so important. And it does, it, it makes everything flow a little bit better. Right? Yeah, it does. On that note, I'd be curious to hear, have you had like any speed bumps in your career and how how do you think they've impacted where you're at at the moment? Yeah. um, So I think becoming a manager recently has been quite an interesting slash challenging experience just because the skills that are required as a design manager are quite different from the skills that are required when you're just an individual contributor. You know, you're now responsible for a team and responsible for people's well-being and it's it can be quite a bit of pressure. And so I'm still trying to find my balance between being too hands off, but also being 
too in the weeds and potentially becoming, you know, micromanaging. I really don't don't want to be that type of manager. You may have an idea of the manager that you want to be, but once you actually become one, it's really challenging to emulate that image. And you might find yourself being way more micromanaging than you thought you were going to be, or find yourself being way less chill than you thought you were going to be. And so finding the balance can be challenging. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll see where that leads me in my career. Either I get better and hopefully continue in that path. And if not, you know, I can always go back to a more specialized IC role. So we'll see. But it, it, yeah, it is a bit of an open question at the time uh, in terms of where I want to go. Definitely. And I think that's, that's such an important um, thing for people to think about when they are considering going into more of like a management supervisor leading role is just because you are amazing at your contributor role and being on the tools and smashing it in that regard, that sometimes doesn't like translate to being able to manage a team and it's not anything personal or it's not because you're not good at your job or a good designer or anything like that. It's just, yeah, sometimes that's just not where people's skills really line up but it sounds to me that you know if collaboration and listening to your team and wanting to be a really good leader are it it sounds like that's huge priorities for you I think with that intention you're gonna be fine (laughs) (laughs) hopefully yeah let's see I'm giving myself a bit of time to learn the ropes of the of the job and and we'll see where that goes yeah yeah I mean yeah I think if you you sound like you listen to your team quite a lot and you collaborate really well with them so as long as that stays alive should be pretty smooth sailing hopefully (laughs) yeah (laughs) I know but it is it is a huge transition I've I've been there done that and it's it's a it's a really big transition going from like okay I know how to do my job but now you're also then like having to help other people do their job and they do it a bit different and it's it's different um different perspectives on how things should be done so yeah exactly yeah, it, it's tricky yeah mm-hmm. it's tricky and it's hard to suck at something again you know starting from zero because yeah. you know after however many years of design i thought i was you know okay at my job and now i'm starting something new and i'm starting from scratch mm-hmm. yeah i have to put myself in that newbie mindset again um and just accept that you know maybe you'll suck for a while that's fine. You'll learn and yeah, it will take the time it takes. Yeah. Embrace that. Yeah. Embrace that. But patience is not my, my forte. So. (laughs) Well, I guess, I guess going from that, is there anything that you do like regularly to, you know, keep that um, self-care and that productivity um, going as, as well as you can? Yeah. 100%. Um, So one of the reasons I moved to Cairns was to be closer to the Great Barrier Reef and go diving as much as I could. Diving makes me so, so happy. I think it's really the one place where I shut off completely. Uh, You know, you're underwater, you're there with fish, um, just not thinking about work. Mm -hmm. I I just got back from a four-day trip, 300 kilometers up north uh, on the reef with minke whales. So the the whales migrate uh, every winter. And you get to swim with them. Yeah, the, the the interactions with the whales are really well managed. You you know, they control the interaction. They come to you. You're not allowed to chase them. But they're such curious animals. They come to you really close. It's just such an incredible experience. And then you're out of service area. So there's no one to ping you. There's no emails. There's no Slack. It's just great to just disconnect. So diving has been huge um, to help me manage stress. And then the other thing I do, which is a bit more accessible, is, is beach volleyball. Yeah. So that's my, you know, social sport. Yeah. And just helps me to blow off some steam. And it's quite social as well. It is. Right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's it's really fun. I guess staying active and staying outdoors is really what helps me. Um, I'm not much of a meditation person or yoga person or breathwork person. I think just mm-hmm. leaving my room is is what helps me really. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're right. Like there's a f- there's so much pressure sometimes to be like, oh, if you're stressed, you've got to be quiet and still to <laughs> get the zen back in your life. And for some people, and myself included, there's just some days where like sitting still just like stresses me out more. Yeah. Like you've got to let off some steam. You've got to go, you know, go work out or do something active. Or the other day, actually, um, over the weekend, it was really windy down here in Newcastle. And 
just being out in the wind I don't know what it was but I'm like oh I feel like it's just like blowing away the cobwebs in my brain like it was just it was really cathartic yeah so yeah I I totally understand with you know sometimes you just need to get moving (laughs) yeah exactly especially as you sit at your desk all day I think it's super important to Mm -hmm. yeah just move yeah yeah amazing so Lisa is there Any like great podcasts or media that you like to consume, books, anything at all that you like to read or partake in when you're not at work? Yeah, I I do like to read, um, mostly fiction, but no great podcast recommendations, unfortunately. I'm just, you know, if I'm interested in a particular topic, I'll go on Spotify and search or on Google and search for, you know, specific topics and then listen to the podcasts that come out. And generally it's, health related podcasts you know particularly like women's health um or fitness um and nutrition but nothing really related to design again when I'm out of work I really try and shut off no that's great I think as I mentioned to you before offline um there's lots of people that I have on here that are either in camp a where they love to talk through and listen to so many um, different design forums and podcasts and books and magazines and everything, or it's can't be completely on the other end of the spectrum where they just want to shut off, which there's no right or wrong answer. Sounds like you can't be all good. (laughs) Well, do you have um, like any, any mentors or business leaders that you, um, that you've had like prior in your career or anyone that inspires you at the moment? Yeah, I've, I've had one, an official mentor. Her name was uh, Laura at Glassdoor, um, or is Laura. She's still very much alive. We're still in touch. <laughs> and she just inspired me because she is a strong woman in, in leadership. And she had a way of leading her teams where she made me feel, and I know some like coworkers feel like they really wanted to put their best work out there for her. And that's something that's quite hard to do, to just inspire people so much that they just want to do their best um, for you. So yeah, she, she just really inspired me as as a leader. Um, and she's also the one that said, hey, uh, you've been talking about going into UX for a while now. Maybe maybe you should consider going back to school and actually doing something about it. So really, I'm really thankful for her to have given me that, that push to go into UX. And then there's another UX leader that I admire a lot. Her name is Julie Zuo. I think that's how you pronou- pronounce her last name. I'm not quite sure. But she wrote The Making of a Manager book, which is pretty much a guide for for new managers going into design. Uh, she was design manager at Facebook. And yeah, lots of, you know, golden nuggets of advice in there. And I follow her on LinkedIn, love everything she posts. Um, so yeah, we were just generally yeah, inspired by her. Cool. Well, yeah, definitely. Um, I will, uh, you know, start to follow her too. That sounds awesome. And a little bit of a rewind onto your mentor at Glassdoor. I think that's that's a really great sign of a good leader is if you've been working with them for a while and they are picking up that you're, you know, wanting to move on or move on to something different, they're not keeping you from achieving that. Some of the best mentors in my career have been people who have pulled me aside and be like, hey, you're great, but I know that you are ready to step onto something new. And you know, having that personal relationship with with those people um, really does push you to be like, hey, they they care about me. And so, yeah, it sounds like that's the kind of relationship that you had with her as well, which is lovely. Yeah, she, she's been amazing and always, yeah, just actually pushed me to leave our team, mm-hmm. which... Yeah, a lot of people wouldn't want to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I'm very thankful for her. Yeah, oh, that's great. And I guess last but not least, Lisa, um, I like to end the podcast with the question of if you could give your younger self some career advice, what would that be? Yeah, that's a good one. I think for me, it would be to not try and be so perfect. I know I have perfectionist tendencies, which actually has hired me more than helped me because you get stuck in wanting to do things perfectly and end up not doing them at all because, you know, obviously things are never perfect. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, I I think I would focus on, on doing things versus doing them perfectly. Um, I think that's the main thing I've learned over the years, which I I still try and apply today. Mm -hmm. And I I still, still get caught up in, in trying to make everything perfect. But yeah, that's what I would tell myself. 
Love that. I think that's such sound advice for people at all stages of their career, whether or not you're starting out or if you're a CEO, knowing that, you know, sometimes good enough is good enough. So yeah, thank you for that advice. And thank you so much for joining us today. No worries. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure chatting with you.